<laughs> yeah, good point. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Duncan. Uh, I'm one of the data scientists at Mango, and I'll be doing this uh, text analysis training. Um, so I think the first thing for me to do is share my screen. Cool. Uh, let me know if you can see that. Cool. Um, so welcome. Um, so the first thing to kind of talk about is maybe the workspace a bit. So it's our studio workspace, um, which you should be able to access by links in the chat. Uh, there's also a GitHub link, uh, which is here. Um, and that can also mean that's just basically where this repository has been copied from. Um, kind of again, just reiterate, uh, it's been recorded. So watch out for that. Um, make sure you're on mute um, unless you don't want to be actually. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to kind of put them on the chat. And then uh, Nicholas or myself will kind of answer them from there just so we don't kind of interrupt the flow too much. Um, if I kind of jump out of here, I can kind of show you where we are. So this is the HSR conference um, kind of projects. So if we go down to here, we can see lots of those. Uh, there should be a text analysis one somewhere. Should be winning that. Um, there we go. And so there's the assignment one. And if you go here and open this, you can then make your own copy from here. Uh, I've made my own copy. That's in my workspace. That's going from here. But yeah. And the next thing to mention is we've got a PDF here, which is kind of the course materials. So I can show you what this is. Uh, PDF materials. We also have the data which has um, the kind of people data, which we talk about, and then also the Star Wars data set. Um, if you don't have any of this, feel free to go to the GitHub link and um, find out where to get all this from. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, maybe the, the next thing to mention is just kind of uh, what we're gonna talk about. Um, so this, this kind of is an introductory workshop for text analysis, but actually we, we're gonna glaze quite quickly over the um, so we're going to go uh, quite quickly through the kind of the dplyr and the tidyverse kind of parts of things. Um, so we're going to first of all talk about kind of basic text manipulations in, in R. So using things like string R and regular expressions to kind of help clean and tidy your data. Um, we're then looking at kind of tidying and summarizing text data. This is kind of pulling it into a tidy text format and kind of what that means. Um, and then also that we can then kind of tidy the data in terms of like uh, pulling out stop words and using stemming and things like this. Uh, quick one about word clouds and the kind of a cool thing called a comparison cloud, which is whereby you can kind of compare different groups, groups of words. Uh, we'll look at kind of n-grams and relationship between words. Um, so I'll kind of explain what n-grams are in a bit. We kind of begin to try and pull out a bit more, okay, these words are connected and therefore the, the idea is maybe they're connected by meaning as well. Um, we'll kind of call it a cool way to visualize that. Um, then also start doing some text, some sentiments analysis. So we'll kind of bind sentiments onto this tidy text um, data. And then kind of so the point of that is then we can begin to pull out quantitative results from these texts around sentiment. And then finally, we'll look at word document frequency. So this is a way of kind of looking at the term frequency uh, compared to the inverse document frequency of, of a document. It's a way of pulling out um, really like kind of keywords in a certain document compared to say a, a, a wider body of work. Um, but yeah, cool. So that's kind of, that's that to start off with. Um, Again, if you have any of those who are just start who are just joining, um, the so yeah, so the copy of the R Cloud environment is on the chat. Um, probably send that again, uh, Nicholas, if you could do that. Um, and again, the data is on the, on a GitHub link or on the link that's about to be sent in the chat again. Um, but yeah, cool. So let's get started on the material. So kind of the, the first thing we're actually going to talk about is just very simple text analysis with um, string R. So actually I'm just going to library this first because it actually has string R in it. Oh, it does. Yeah. Um, so let me know if everyone can see this okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the first thing I want to show is just this, how to combine strings. It's very similar 
but to kind of your pay style. You do, for example, mango. Cats. You can just kind of combine these. Cool. Uh, so you can see that this um this kind of combining these like so. That's maybe not quite what we want. So what we can actually put in here is there's this separate argument. We can put a space in there, and that kind of gives us more what we what we want. Uh, we can also put in. So if I actually take that and just make a, a vector. Very greatly string vector. This string vector just looks like this. And what we can do is we can put that into string C. And that thing kind of combines so that it actually doesn't do anything um, because it's vectorized. And what we can actually then do is with this class argument, we can say, you know, this place in there. And that kind of gets us the same thing. Um, Similarly, what we can actually do is kind of combine them. Um, so if we actually put a separate in the model, that's just sorry. the first thing to probably show you is you can actually have to combine multiple vectors because see this hasn't really done too much. Uh, so it should just show one to three. And that's just a simple one to three vector. Um, so this does, this kind of combines in this fashion. So it kind of combines these two vectors element wise and then collapses it based on here. And what we can actually do is, is add another argument. So this is the same argument above here, just separate, say, put that dash. And that kind of combines all together like this. Um, and you kind of imagine how this, this might be used in, in some settings where instead of using paste, you're using this, this function here, uh, which is actually like fully factorized, and it's, it's very nice. Um, the, the next function is probably string and sub. Um, Um, so what this does is this is a way of just very quickly kind of slicing or taking out substrings from your text. So you can actually give it a start, uh, say the first position, end is your fifth. Um, you can therefore just slice this string and take out the second, second parts of it. Um, the cool thing about this also is it does negative indexing. Um, so for example, if you want to say start minus three, this starts three in from the end. And then takes it to, to the end being the last character. Um, and again, that's something that's going to be quite useful. What kind of paste isn't as easy to do that with. And you can um, then you can also say, for example, go back a bit further and so it's a bit more junk, but um, take strings back from the end, uh, which again is quite nice. Was there a sound issue? Nicholas, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so do you let us know if, if we have sound issues, but... Um, Some, sometimes it comes a little bit um, choppy or a bit, little bit robotic. I don't know whether it's when you're typing, Duncan, that it interferes a little bit with chatting, because when you're not typing, it's, it's clear. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you can type a little bit and then chat and try to minimize the overlap. Okay, sure. Yeah, no, there's yeah. a few people in the chat who've said uh, they are struggling to hear. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so the next thing I kind of want to talk about is uh, regular expressions. So regular expressions are, um, a lot of these, these string R functions require something called, a, you know, require a pattern. The pattern is going to match with or to extract or, or something like this. Um, And kind of regular expressions provide a really good way of making much more general patterns. Um, so rather than just say having, um, rather than just say matching to cats uh, as, as just the C A T, it kind of enables you to match to say anything that starts with a C and there's three letters, um, and so on. Oh, 
I don't think it's the typing issue that's the issue. Um, are you still able to hear me? Yeah. Um... Okay. I'm not too sure what can be done about that. Um, I have the same problem with the, with my microphone, the one inside the laptop. So if you have by any chance Bluetooth headphones or... No, I don't have that kind of thing. Mm. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I'll try and just keep it as clear as I can. I think that's probably anything I could do. Yeah, you see now it's it's pretty clear. That's why I was I was thinking there might have been the type bit, the, the, the typing bit, but uh, okay, uh, yeah, maybe if if there's an exercise done, can we can check the Microsoft the, the microphone sensitivity on your mic? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll play around with that in a bit. Sorry, everyone. Um. So yeah. So kind of back to regular expressions. So the idea with regular expressions is you you can much with these much more general patterns, and these can therefore be a lot more powerful. If you're trying to validate uh, IDs or like match to emails in a larger text or something like this. Um, and to kind of start off with this, if I just pull in the notes here um, and show you this, this table. So this very good expressions are a huge topic. Um, it, you know, let's say many, many books cover exactly how to do them and the most efficient way of doing them, exactly how, how they work behind the scenes. Um, so here I'm just going to show you just a few that I find particularly useful. Uh, so the first thing with regular expressions is uh, any character matches to itself. So for example, a capital A will match to a capital A. Uh, the next one is this dot, is it a wild card? Um, and it kind of matches to anything. And that kind of may sound a bit like, well, what's the point in that? Um, but it, it's really useful in kind of making more complex patterns. And I'll kind of show you how to use this later on. Um, this, this bar here is the logical or. Um, so for example, cat or dog, you could, for example, write something like that. Um, this the square brackets notation is um, kind of saying one of one of the characters in the brackets. Um, I mean, if you put a carrot, this carrot symbol in there as well, it kind of goes not one of the carrot, not one of these characters. Um, and also in this, uh, in these uh, square brackets, you'd also put a, a range, for example, capital A uh, to capital Z is kind of the, the range of the full alphabet. And I'll use this quite a bit. And all the lowercase, uh, lowercase ranges and also zero to nine being like any number from zero to nine. Um, yeah, so again, it's, it's worth mentioning here that these are one of, so A to Z is A or B or C and, and so on. Um, so that's really useful. Uh, the, the next thing to mention is these anchors. So you got, for example, this dollar symbol, which anchors that A to being at the, the last character. Um, you have this carrot symbol when used like this is at the start. So anchors that A to be at the start of the character string. Uh, the star matches to zero or more. So this, uh, again, might say, why would you want to match to zero? Uh, and again, it's, it's kind of a, a wild card kind of character. And again, it's really useful for making more complex and more flexible patterns. Uh, the plus is uh, one, one or more. Um, the question mark is optionally. So you can kind of imagine this is zero or one times. This, is, this character is repeated. Um, and then... A, and then you can kind of put the, the num new num number of times there. So rather than it being just one or more, you can actually say, I want it four times or something like this using these, these curly brackets. And you can actually put a, uh, a range like this. Um, yeah. So to kind of show how these might be useful, um, I'm gonna start off by reading in this people's data set. So again, like this, uh, this data is just in my data folder. So it's this data, data set here. Uh, if, again, if you don't have it, um, follow the GitHub link and so on. Uh, you've got to find it. Um, so if I show you what the head of this looks like. So this is just a list of kind of, um, kind of dummy names, second name, emails, some kind of ID or reference number. And then an amount, for example, like a sales amount or you know, something like this. Uh, and the, kind of the first thing we might notice is that this column is not looking very pretty. It's got random characters in it. It's got some currency symbols. Um, it's also got a null. So maybe this is going to be equal to something like this. Um, so the first thing we might want to do 
is actually trying to find it up, make that as a numerical. see is we get an error quite quickly. It's saying now oh, there's this error at this column here. So um, this 12, um, which makes sense. We should expect that. Um, so what we can actually do is we can use this um, string remove all function. Sorry, it's worth mentioning here again that um, a lot of these functions have remove and remove all. Because what regular expressions do, they tend to match to the, the first time they meet that pattern in the string and then stop. But if we move, if you use string remove all, then we can actually match to, to all elements at all times like that. Um, so we use string remove all and then put in amount. And then this then takes a pattern. And in here, we're going to just put in a pattern box. I'll show you what that looks like. So yeah, now we've been able to very quickly remove that pound symbol from there. Um, okay, now we want also the R. So if I just put that down, we can actually use the R to go for or R. Okay, yeah, now we've now got rid of that. That's fine. Um, actually, there's, there's a nicer way to write this in reference expressions, and that's just to use this square brackets like this. And this is in saying an of pound symbol or R. Okay, we just get the same. This is gone. Uh, now you may be thinking, okay, that's fine because this is a small data set, but actually this <laughs> doesn't scale very well. We may get some new data in that then has a different symbol that's uh, going to irritate us. Um, and so what we can actually do is say actually remove anything that isn't zero to nine. So this is also being able to get rid of that null. Um, this is then quite a lot cleaner, because then we can then just put this as, as numeric. And there we go. And we also get the DNA as kind of what we want. It's, it's definitely worth mentioning here that this is probably not advisable to just blindly do this. Uh, we would probably do want to know if, okay, if there's a pound symbol and a dollar symbol in there, we should probably worry about that not being clean. We should probably remove that anyway. Um, things like this, if it's a percentage sign in, in other contexts, it's like, okay, we we'll just divide that by 100 and so on. Uh, so you should always look through your data. And kind of a really nice way to do that is to use something called string detect. Um, so let's go people data again. So what, what string detect does is anytime in this uh, in this kind of this vector, essentially this amount column, it sees this pattern, it will return true. Uh, so we can do what we can do is use this to filter out data. Um, then we can say okay. So this is then a, quick, a really quick way to say okay, these columns are not the columns. We, yeah, these are not good columns. And if we can quickly go through and say okay, actually it makes sense to just you know strip that out or something like this. Yeah, this being a type or something like that. Um, you can also start to look at the reverse. So there's another argument in here, which is called the gate. And I'll show you the good problems. So you can kind of, if you wanted to just remove them, then you could just do this to, okay, now that's the data set that I want to be working with. The, um, I think maybe the, the next thing to start talking about is IDs. And it kind of gives you a good opportunity to kind of show you a bit more of the, the various expressions. So, um, I should use fit again. I'm 
Watch me use that D, sorry. So the first thing that I want to show you is um, how to use an anchor. So this is the, the end anchor with the dollar symbol. And here I'm just going to say, okay, well, let's let's take these IDs and say, let's filter any that return in an A. So as an A is this last character here. And that's been able to just pull those out for us. Um, we can do, okay, well, what if we want to say all IDs that are in the first half of the alphabet? And what we can do, so it starts, this first character uh, starts with, say, A to M. Um, we can then do something like this. So what this is doing is saying, um, I want anchor this to start and what it is, A to M, so A or B or, or so on through to M. Um, and this thing gives us this. We can see we've got E for the first one, A, J, and B. So for example, not Z. And then there's kind of an example of how to use the uh, another example there is say what if we want um any of vowels. So you can say A E I O U. Um and it can start with any vowel. Um can show what that looks like. So you see we've got E and A. Um then what we've decided actually I want the second character here. So not the first, but actually the second one to be a vowel for some unknown reason. Um, we can just put a dot in there, and this is that bar card that I mentioned earlier. What this does is it says, okay, match to anything there. That first character can be anything, but then I want a second character to be a vowel. And you can see this then pulled out of this Q, O, and D, E. Um, that's kind of how you might begin to use these, these um, that wild card character. The, Thing with the dot is, what if you want to match to to the, that dot? There's loads of times when that is actually really useful. Um, and kind of to do that, to kind of to show you how, how to start using this, um, I'm going to introduce another function called string view. And um, if you run into problems here, this is because it requires another HTML uh, package. Um, so it's actually in depends. Uh, this is all the package you'll need, and this is one called HTML widgets. Um, but yeah, just so, just so you know, you yeah, have problems with this. Um, so if if I take string view and then put in a vector and then say you know, uh, and then I can say put in pattern. So if I first of all just um, what this does. So what this does is this opens up a uh, HTML viewer. Which is really useful for say like actually building up your regular expressions so you're like okay i want to match that bit but not that bit and this is working and that's not um so string view is a really useful way to try to help you put that up um so if we wanted to say match the dots we can't just do that because then that actually matches to everything and then kind of what i mentioned earlier is they actually match to the first time it matches um, which is therefore just the first character here. Um, so what you have to do is escape it using this uh, backslash. And then this doesn't work because this is actually now escaping. So backslash has already escaped characters in R strings, uh, which means it's kind of doing something quite weird. Um, so what you instead want to do is a double backslash, uh, as in you're almost escaping the escape in R. Um, and this allows you to then actually get to these dots. Uh, these kind of yeah so that's um something that's it's not obvious in r um but it's still super valuable um cool so i'm going to talk more about kind of how we might go about say, a, a process of building up a expression the same match to these ideas um so if i just show you what the state looks like again so if we're looking at these ideas, we can IDs, we can see there's a kind of a uh, common pattern. So they kind of start off with these two, uh, two letters, then they've got three numbers followed by a letter at the end. And this letter actually seems to be an A or a B. Um, actually, if we look closely, there's this row here, uh, this Dan character. 
it actually has a, an ID that isn't quite consistent with the others. So what we might want to do as part of our workflow is to strip that out or, or let's flag it. Um, so what I'm going to do is use string view to kind of So use, use string view to try and help build up one of these. So kind of the first thing I kind of mentioned there was that, okay, well, it, it ends in an A or a B. That might be quite a nice start. So what we can do is we can say, okay, anchor this to the end and want it to be an A or a B. You can see it's been able to pull that out quite nicely. And then next thing we know is, okay, this actually starts with two letters. So what are we going to do there? We can go, okay, starts with, and then we'll a letter, so go with A to Z. Two of them. See, that's the match to these first two letters, just like that, crazy. But actually, there's a, there's a nicer way to do this with expressions and that's to you can then use this amount for going to it. And then finally, like this matching the three numbers in the middle. So, what we can do with that is go to zero to nine. In. And there we go. You can see that this, this middle one that belongs to Dan is now and uh, not lighting up, which is kind of exactly what we want. So what we can then, then do is then pull these all together. So I pull that bit from the end. And that bit from the start, you can, you can see that this is still quite simple, but it's just not very pleasant to look at or read. Um, and you can see that it matches like the whole ID, which is fine. Um, and we've been able to exclude that. So you, you could then put that into, say, a filter or a uh, extract or something like that to then kind of pull that up. Cool. Um, the next two functions I want to talk about um, are actually from TidyR. Um, and the kind of reason why I'm talking about them is because, A, I think they're really, really useful. Um, and second, because I think we're going to use them later on in the training. Uh, and these two functions are separate and unite. So separate, what it can do is it can split out a column uh, into, into two. Um, it's actually kind of awkward to do with a mutate. That's why separate is quite so valuable. Um, so this first argument is what's the data which we're piping in, um, then the column. And this is the, the column that we want to separate, uh, which say, say, for example, we wanted to split emails into the username and the domain. Um, we should put email in here. And we've got this into, uh, this takes a, a vector of names, so say username. Username and domain. Um, and then we then have this space separate there. Uh, so you could, for example, put any regular expressions in here, but just because of the angle that it's at, so we'll not show that you can use any character in here. Okay, does that crash? Did you crash for you? No, there. I think he's back, right? Yeah, so it's like yeah. things back in. Cool. And that's really struggling. If it continues, uh, Duncan, for you, maybe you can uh, move this over to your local R Studio setup because yeah. at least from a look and feel, it's the same. This might be because either the project is overloaded or something with internet. Yeah, no, that sounds right. Okay, this um, seems to be having some fun. 
Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, if you give me two minutes, I will jump into my local studio. Can anybody else on the chat just drop a message if they're having the same issue? Just want to see whether it's just Duncan or whether um, there is a, a more wider problem with the R Studio Connect or the R Studio Cloud. Cool. Thanks. Okay. A few of you are saying no issues, so that's that's good. So yeah, that can I suppose just copy paste what you had already so far or just rerun stuff on your local and then you can reshare. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Cool. Um, let me just uh, try again because somebody's saying that the link didn't work. It's at the R Studio Cloud. Let me just try that again. Loading when I click on it, can you? Um, the username is cd169. Can you try that again and drop me a private message if, if you still issue? Cool. Uh, can you all see that? Yep. Cool. Uh, cool. Sorry about that. Um, so just read that again. Uh, cool. There we go. Um, so, so what what we were doing were was we were taking the emails and we're separating them into its username and its domain uh, by using this. Um, Piece here. Um, so you can make this column split email into username and domain uh, by the separator. Um, and then the the next thing is just unite. So what unite does is able to, to combine two columns. Um, and say for example, we can say the first thing we'll take is what's the new column called, which is full name. Say if we want to combine, um, combine the, the first name and the second names together, then we can unite this into a full name, um, then column, columns. The, uh, the next argument is then the first column, which is just first name. It's second name. Um, and then we can also separate it in here as well. So it's different this case. It's very similar to what we're doing with string, string C, right at the start of the that then pulls four names together into this. Um, actually, what we can also do is there's another one called remove. If so, we want to then keep, okay, the full name, but then also the first name and second name, all in the same thing. Cool. Um, so there's actually now a bit of an exercise. Um, so, um, so if you look at the, um, the notes, it's on page 16. Um, what I can probably do is just pull that into there. Um, and so you, there's um, this exercise here. So it's currently 10.38, so maybe we want to take five minutes to have a bit of that. Um, you can like, have a practice with the regular expressions and I'll kind of pull you, pull you back to show the solutions about five minutes. Cool. All right, see you then.
Cool. Um, if you let me know with the thumbs up, um, how you doing on that exercise? We've got one, one on the chat. Thank you. Cool. We've got a few trickling in. Um, cool. Um, let's go through the uh, solutions. We can always go through them more later on. Um, so yeah, the first question there was just using the first name column, uh, select people that start with an A or a B. Um, so obviously the first thing you have to do is read in the data, um, just like that. And then you can just say string detect them with an A or a B, or you could use the square brackets if you prefer. Um, so then uh, the next one is exactly four letters. So names with exactly four letters. So what kind of what I've done here is added uh, an extra name that actually, so I've changed from, Ab from um, Abby into Abigail, just so we can kind of prove that it's not matching to the longer one. Um, then what we do here is we can actually use an anchor, anchor at the start and end, um, and then a dot, which says match to anything, and then match to anything four times. So this is the name was enables us to say, just get names with um, four characters in it. Uh, Third one is uh, only numeric characters from this bit of mess. Um, so there's a few different ways to do this, um, but this is the way I'm going to go with it. It's just say, okay, zero to nine. Um, and the way string extracts all is kind of doing is uh, it kind of out outputs this list. Um, and so what I'm doing is just taking the element and then collapsing it with string C. So I'll actually show you what that looks like. So it's just being able to pull them all out and collapse them together. Is this this might be a use case you want, or you might want this in another form. Um, but kind of just gives you the tools to kind of play around with what you're doing. Um, and then that last part is just about um, okay, so given a real life situation whereby you have an email or a phone number or usernames and uh, postcodes here, uh, how do you begin to kind of uh, write a build up record expression that's able to, to kind of match to these? Um, as a kind of extension, I'm going to go, and go through it in detail, but um, you kind of see the kinds of things we're working with here and actually how they begin to look very messy very quickly. Um, yeah, cool. Um, move on to this next bit. So this, this next part of the, uh, the course is all about sort of tidy data, so tidy text data and kind of what this means. So we're quite used to having tidy data in R as being like, okay, so one row is each observation. Um, but then what we have with text data is we normally have, um, so uh, we, we normally want to kind of text is say so each observation could be like a string of text. Uh, so like a sentence or even a book or a document or something like this. Um, but then what we want to do is tidy text data is actually each token, uh, each text token is, is on each row. Um, so what, what this means by token is in this context, it really just means word, um, but it's in we'll look later on to how actually token can mean different things. So for example, it could be uh, a set of characters, it could be a sentence in itself, um, it could be any of these kind of things. Um, but here token just means word. Um, and it's kind of each row has a different word on it. So I'll kind of show you what it means. Uh, the, First thing to do actually is just load in this uh, Star Wars data set we'll be using. So th there is another data set within R called Star Wars, but that's actually a different one. Um, so I'd recommend just calling it something slightly different. Yeah, I'm using this underscore. Um, so what this data is, is it's from the Star Wars movies, so from the uh, four, five, and six. Um, and it contains the, the line, the movie, 
So it's in like which movie, uh, the movie title, and then which character said each line. So it then has a, a column called dialogue here, which is then, did you hear that shut down the main reactor? Kind of the, the nicest way to kind of see this is actually to use a view. So you can see how each, each row is like this. Um, and it's also got a whole bunch of summary things on the end. And kind of after this, you'll work out how to make them yourself. But actually, for now, we're, we're kind of going to ignore them. Uh, I'd encourage you afterwards, by the way, to go and explore this data set and kind of play around and see what else you can, we can get out of it. Um, but yeah, so you can see this, this first piece of dialogue here is actually what we're interested in. Is, did you hear that? The ship had a right there. Um, so yeah, the main function here is um, it's called unnest tokens. It's from the tidy text package. So there's lots of different uh, packages out there for helping you do text analysis, text mining. Um, but there's always this kind of this difference between um, wanting to do modeling or kind of uh, build models for text um, or versus doing analysis with text. So this is a text analysis course. And this is much more about, okay, how do we kind of draw insights from text we already have? Um, and kind of, therefore, a, a really useful package that's able to do this is this tidy text package. What we're going to do is just take out uh, some stuff of this. So if I go with Star Wars Episode Four and I sign that, say Star Wars, So just, just for kind of ease when I kind of show you, I'm just going to filter out just the movie, just the fourth movie, and then just select these key columns. So that's now just the line, the character, and this is all from that fourth film. Sorry. And then, then what we want to do is actually tokenize this kind of properly. Say we're interested in word tokens. Uh, so what we can do is we start with episode four, then unnest tokens. So what this does is this takes um, first argument is this dead frame. Then what we want is the output. So here we want output to be word, and its input is going to be. Dialogue. So what that's done is it's able to pull all of these um, dialogues now into just a single word in each row. So you see that, that what, that, what was that first sentence has now become a, did you hear that? They've shut down the main reactor um, all by, so this um, character 3PO and these words have now been pulled down this. Um, this is really helpful for like everything else we're gonna do. Um, and you'll see we, we use this frequently throughout the course. Um, it's really useful for being able to just join on sentiments, do counts, do things like this. Um, and actually that's the very first thing we're gonna do. Um, so if I'm going to take this data and actually just count it. So notice how this dialogue column has now become word. So that's what we're putting in here. I'm just going to count that and still push through. 
Uh, you can see the, the most common words here are the, you, to, I, a, uh, and these are really not really useful uh, in general. Uh, but these are still the most frequent words in the text. Actually, how quick and easy it is to get there is, is really quite impressive. Um, yeah. The next thing to talk about is then stop words. So all of these, the, you, and so on, these are all stop words because they, they don't really have any meaning in the text. They're, they're kind of around there to kind of make the, make the grammar work and things like this. Um, so what we can do is within tidy text, there is, there is something called uh, stop words. And what this is, is this is a, a large data frame of different stop words, of words that we're likely to want to just filter out of our data when we're doing this analysis. Um, what this is, this is just a, a data frame. It's within tidy text. Um, and it's, um, it kind of has a lexicon. So a lexicon is kind of a, a body of, of words. Um, and so the lexicon is smart. Um, and it's, it's kind of, it's a known, uh, developed by academics. Uh, it's kind of say, okay, these are stop words. These are words that are less interesting. And we'll see later on if we use other lexicons, um, which for say sentiment analysis, uh, where we can take positive and negative sentiment um, assigned to each word. There are loads of other lexicons out there. So this is a lexicon for stop words. There are words out there which kind of give you an indication of how positive or, or negative different things are uh, with sentiment. There's also things um, around say how happy or um, you know, and, and so on, or, or polarized, for example, is a good one uh, for tweets, um, different different um, words or combinations of words suggest to be. Um, so, what we can do is now that we've got this, this count here, we'll get down to here, is using these top words. We can actually anti join onto our original data frame. Um, so once we then add to stop words, which then kind of filters them out um, and then recount. And I'll show you the head of that one. And you can see, okay, loop, that is a valuable word in understanding what this text is about, uh, being the main character. And you get things like uh, sir and ship. So uh, 3PO calls Luke sir the whole way through the film. So this is actually makes sense. These two are very high. Uh, ship, red, time, and R2, uh, and so on. Um, and that's just a very quick way of immediately getting, okay, much more meaningful results from, from this text. Um, it's worth note, mentioning here that we can actually move other unwanted content. Just say actually we, we already know all the character names, so there's no point kind of having them in here. Um, we can actually do a very similar approach to here. So I'm going to copy this down. And instead of actually joining your stop words, um, I'm also going to just copy this down and also anti join on the main characters. Uh, the thing that I need to do actually make this dead forever. Just to make it neat, I'm going to keep this as words so that kind of matches up. Cool, so I'm sure I'm just like this. It's a very similar to kind of what stop words look like. And then we can then also anti join on those. Oh, yeah. That's fine. As this is saying that um, word is a factor in one and not in the other, so it's making it into one. Um, you can see again, we've now lost loop from the top. Um, 
which is um, which can be really useful. Say say you you were doing some survey analysis and you're looking at some customer feedback and you already knew okay well actually we don't want any product names because um therefore like they're going to come up really common and actually not really adding any value then you can actually make your own set of words to filter out quite easily by doing this. The next thing to talk about is stemming. So you, like, um, what's stemming it? So we're gonna use a language called Snowball C. And here, in here there's this function called word stem. And uh, if I can just show you how this is how this is working, it becomes quite obvious why this is so useful. So what this is doing is is just taking the it's it's taking each word in its vector and it's able to stem it just into its root. Uh, so here, for example, fear, fearing, and fearful have all gone down to the same root. Um, and also play, playing, and play have also gone down to the same root. Uh, so this is really useful again while doing word frequencies, as someone might have written something in a past tense or um, in, in different tenses, and therefore it's really you know you can then stem these all together, and then suddenly they're the same word. Um, and you can then do counts a lot more effectively. It's really worth noticing here that play has actually now got this I on the end. Uh, like, where does that come from? Uh, this is actually really common for things that end in a Y like this. Um, and, and it's just, what it means is that another common word reduces down to this or similar. And so adding this I just makes it, um, makes it, that, it, makes it different um, while still kind of conveying enough meaning across. Um, so just watch out for that. Um, so what we can do is if we take this piece again, so I'm actually going to get rid of characters. Actually, I'm going to mutate the column this time. I say word equals word stem of word. Um, so what it's doing is it's taking every word, it's then going to stem it, and then put it back in. So we can then redo the count. Um, and not much seems to have changed for this, um, but this is then what you can then do to um, maybe if I show a few more. Yeah, you can see it's now stem force the or then C at the end. Um, and this can quite often pull out different insights, or at least rank, or maybe change the order of ranking things lower down, um, which is yeah, really, really, really useful. Um, so yeah, they're they're kind of the two two kind of main things is um, looking at removing stop words and stemming them, uh, and this can get you really quite good counts or good insights from counts quite quickly. Um, yeah, so now there's the another exercise, briefly. Um, so again, it's just one eleven. So I'll give you five minutes to do this, and um, off you go. Any questions? Put them in the chat.
cool how are people are doing i realize it's probably not not quite enough time to do uh, the, the whole exercise but and let me know how you get on do you um i realized last time i said thumbs up but then my i don't think there's actually thumbs up on this um so yeah if you similar to what you did before if you can click yes or no um in the in the kind of participants part that'd be really useful got one yes We've got a few coming in. Right, cool. Um, I will go through the answer, I think. Cool. So, hopefully this is very similar to what we've done before. Uh, so looking at the Star Wars text as a whole, rather than just taking episode four. Um, and then we're going to tidy the book into one token per row structure. Uh, what are the most common words in the films as a whole? Um, then what about once we remove stop words, and then if stemming it changes anything. Um, so remember it's a library in the right libraries, tidy text, and we'll see. Uh, we can read in the data. Uh, we're going to just take out the columns that we're interested in. Gee, try running this. Um, and then unless the tokens outputs word, inputs dialogue, and look at the counts. So hopefully you've got something similar to that, which is very similar to what we got before with these uh, V and U and I right at the top, very high frequencies. And then anti join the stop words, which is here. Um, there we go, we get the characters, uh, Luke, Sir and R2, Dewey and so on. Um, and then for this final bit, we can actually use this mutate. And that's kind of all there is to it. And you can see uh, few have changed, uh, but we may want to look at you know, dive into that a bit more detail if we're interested. Cool. So this next part of the course is about looking at word clouds. Okay, so now we've got these frequencies of these kind of useful words. Um, is there a nice way to kind of present them or display them or present them back to stakeholders and so on? And of course, yes, the answer is word clouds. Um, word clouds, I think, do get a, they can be really useful, but they also can be a bit messy. And uh, really what they're showing is can sometimes not be so clear. Um, but I still think they're a valuable thing to look at. Um, there's lots of word clouds uh, in, in R, so lots of word cloud packages. Um, so now I'm just going to look at just one called word cloud. And what this wants to take is um, this function here called word cloud. Uh, and what this takes is their, the, the list of words, their frequencies, and then a few other arguments. So what we have to first we'll do is make our data into that kind of uh, into that correct form. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is go back and just take from what I read in this one. So this is me just having filtered out and selected the right columns. I can do that. So this is what the data looks like. So this is all bit of a mess. Um, so it's it's just the uh, this is where this is filtered out. So it's just 
where I footed this in episode four, and then the line character dialogue. So the first thing I can do is unnest tokens. Um, words, and then dialogue. Then I'm going to add some words. Get my frequencies so this is then count by word and then I'm going to use my size this uh, to another one. I'm just going to pull it. This is then just that thing that we saw before. Then what we can do is into word clouds. We can put words is this, so unfortunately it's not, it's not very tidy. Uh, words and then the frequencies. Just end on this. And there's a few other arguments that we can put in that uh, make it a bit nicer. So maybe the most important one is max words. Uh, means it doesn't kind of break our system. Let's put 50 in for there. And we can also make it on brand with Mangani. And there we go. And there's our word cloud that's appeared in our view. Uh, you can see kind of the, these top words being uh, ship, Luke, sir. These are just the same that we've uh, we've been seeing. Um, so this is nice, this is fine. Uh, obviously, what we could do is we could maybe filter by different characters. Um, so you could say, okay, what are the top words that are two says or, or versus other characters like Vader or so on. Um, but actually, another way to do this is to do something called a comparison cloud. And what a comparison cloud does uh, is, as the name suggests, uh, it allows you to kind of compare and contrast different uh, different sets of, of words by two different proofs. Um, so again, this isn't very tidy. Um, but what we want to do is produce something called a, um, I think it's a document term. Let me get throw it around. So a term frequency matrix, uh, where each term is then, so each term is in each word is uh, as well as a row. Uh, and then the frequencies in each group are uh, going along the columns. Uh, this, this isn't very tidy because actually this also requires the terms to be the row names. Um, so I'll kind of show you how to get this into the right form. Um, so the function we're going to use is called comparison. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is basically take what we have here as a base. So this Star Wars episode four, just take that. So this is the Star Wars episode four data that we're just going to have read in. Um, change this to comparison cloud. Um, so the first thing I actually say I want to do is say compare, uh, say layer and beta. So what I can do is I can filter this data as a character in in layer or beta. And I'm going to unnest the tokens, anti join stop words. I'm going to count. I'm going to show you what that looks like. See, we've got word and then n. Um, I'm trying to remember how this works. Those one characters in here.
Honestly, it's because I wouldn't count. I didn't count that. What's going on? There we go. So we've got the words down the side, which character said it, and then that counts. Um, and then what we want to do is make this into a uh, into the right kind of matrix shape. Um, so we're going to pivot wider. Not longer. Um, so what then there is names from character, values from n, which is this one here, then values fill. And what values fill is just saying is, is any value that we're, where there isn't one, rather than giving it an, an na, which is going to fit with zero, because obviously the count's there for zero. Um, and then what we're going to do is type this actually into a data frame as opposed to a table. And the reason for this is because we need to access row names, and uh, row names are actually not really allowed in um, tables. So now we've got word there, layer, and beta. And then what we're going to do is go row names. Yeah. It's compression cloud, and then just assign that to. Word. So again. You see we now have words as row names. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is drop. We're gonna just drop that words column. You see, this is now in a. The row names are just the, the words. We then have the two groups, layer and beta, and then we have counts in this kind of matrix in the middle. Um, then we can then put this into the comparison graph. So there we go. You can see this has been able to make this comparison cloud of the two characters. So uh, you can kind of tell who's who just from the words. But one person is focused more on hope, um, Kenobi and Luke, whereas the other ones like ships, plans, and force. Um, this is quite a nice way of kind of pulling out the two different themes uh, of what the two characters are saying. Um, I was just asked about the hotkeys that I did. Um, it's Alt and Shift on my machine. If you're, if you're in a Mac. It could be different. Um, I unfortunately don't know if it was on Mac, but what you can always do is go into tools and then keyboard shortcuts. By the way, because anyone's not seen this. Um, so again, that was Alt and Shift, and then just use the whole to move it around. No worries. Um, cool. The new thing to say here is that um, these, these are never that neat. Um, because of, because these are generated randomly, um, they they're a bit of a pain to to get to fit nicely on a page. So if you if you find one that you like, um, save it. Um, otherwise, you try setting a random seed and then changing the random seed each time uh, to try and get this consistent. Uh, but just watch out because it's uh, it's it's a bit of it can be a, a bit irritating. You see here it's been a bit cut off here. Um, yeah, cool. There is now another exercise. Um, so I will let you have five minutes to do that. See, this one's quite a bit nicer because it's got these full titles on. Cool. Um, see you in five.
Cool. How's everyone doing? Again, if you would put a yes on the, um, I don't actually know what it looks like for you. For me, it comes up in the participants pane, um, but a yes or a no, uh, if you can, to kind of to give us an indication how you will get on. Cool, put one yes. Maybe give you a minute more. Cool. Right, I might just go through the answers. So this was just making a word cloud of your favorite character, uh, and then consider the separate movies and compare and contrast. So this was obviously trying to do a, a word cloud, a comparison cloud. Um, so obviously you need to read in the data. Um, Select the, the key columns. You wouldn't have to filter because you want you, you want all of them. I uh, look at it. Um, then do my this. Then again, unnecessary tokens. So this is kind of one of the key parts. Um, it's a word, and then from dialogue, uh, attributes of words, and then count on two characters. And say if you're interested, and say what. Tarkin, um, one of the evil empire people, uh, is up to, and we can put a word cloud of him. He's very interested in the, the rebel base and the station and the princess and so on. Um, it's always good. Um, and then for a comparison cloud, what we can do is again, unless tokens, and should we stop words, count, this time include movie. So in places where we had character last time, but movie. Uh, pivot wider. So again, this is because we want it in a slightly different form uh, of this kind of term frequency matrix. Uh, we then have to put it into a data frame because we then need to change the row names. Uh, so this is a little bit of a, a pain, but actually you don't really need to change the row names. You could just drop the column. Um, actually, no, sorry, you do need the row names. That's a lie because you need to plot them. Um, and so you then have yeah, you then put the put the row names in, uh, drop the the word column, and then you can then do this comparison cloud. So I'm going to see if I can just run. So you see, this is what the matrix looks like. Now you have the word, and then each group, so each movie. And then we can plot that out. See, it takes a bit more. There's a few warnings, I think it's kind of overfilling the space. Um, hopefully we should have got something similar. Cool. Um, so this next bit is about n-grams. So before what we were doing is we've been tokenizing by word. Um, there's also, you can also tokenize by something called n-grams. And what an n-gram is is whereby you tokenize it uh, by n words. Uh, so, for example, if it's a bigram, it would be two words. If it's a trigram, it's three words, and so on. Um, it's maybe worth mentioning here, you can actually tokenize this in loads of different ways. So uh, I've recently been doing some work where I've been tokenizing into character shingles, um, which are like just groups of three characters moving along. Um, and that was really, yeah, that was a bit different, really helpful. Um, but, yeah, I'll show you how, how we can begin to tokenize these things differently. So again, if I start off with Star Wars data being read in and made into slope five, 
me. Um, then from there, I'm going to unnest the tokens. Again, from Word and dialogue, sorry, into Word and dialogue. So I'm going to use this token argument. So token here, I'm going to put it to engrams. Where n equals two. So it's then instead of diagrams, um, show what it looks like to do. So this is now rather than uh, did you hear that they shut down the main reactor? It's now did you you hear hear that? And so on. Um, you can see kind of how this is kind of inclusive. It hasn't like just gone the first two, it's like one, two, and then three, four. Um, it's kind of done this inclusive uh, collection. So you can see actually how this becomes a bit of a problem when you begin to scale, um, but not so much. Cool. So I'm going to save that as. Then what we can then do is we can just look at the count. So this is then okay. What are the most frequent co-occurring words? And apparently it's going to. We then have an NA in here. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, of the all right in the and you can tell these again very stop word ish. Um, so how are we going to filter out stop words when it's in this kind of uh, this form? Um, and so for that, what we can do is we can actually separate them into two columns using the separate function that we met earlier, uh, and then filter each row. So I'll show you that. So we do have to put the counts in first, um, or else they get lost. So taking this um, tokenized into 10 gram data frame, we're then taking the counts. And then we're separating the column word into first word and second word uh, by the separator of a space. You don't actually need this because I think it's just this uh, by default. There's a few things it separates on. Um, but I would like to keep it quite clear. Um, as you can see, it's been able to pull these into the two columns with their accounts. And then from here, I go back to here, and then anti join on stop words like we did before. This time, we're going to say by first word, word. So this is the way that blinks together. And also so this is going to actually join on both of these. And I'm also going to drop an A because we're going to set it there. There we go. Now we've got rid of a lot of those uh, common uh, pairs of words, and we're now being good about Obi Wan and Obi Wan Kenobi, which is uh, you know good that we can see a main character in there. And things like rebel base and R2 units, uh, these are all good.
Um, and now what's really cool about this um, is if, if you've maybe done a bit of thinking about networks, is this is an edge between two words. And we can kind of imagine this like a, a network. So OB and one are connected by being close to each other in the text. Um, and then what we then have is a count or kind of a, a strength or intensity for that connection. Um, and R2 and units are also connected by strength 11 um, and so on. So this is actually kind of a list of edges in our network. Um, it's kind of, it's a really cool way to think about that. Um, so what we're just gonna do is a really nice way to visualize this is to actually show a network. Um, if you do the whole thing, it gets way too busy, way too quickly. Um, but what you can do is say, take out a key character like Luke and a key idea like the force and then have a look at kind of how that is, uh, how that kind of linked together. So the first thing we're going to do actually is library in a, a collection of packages. So um, it's just make it a lot easier to produce these kind of network plots. And particularly one of the functions is really useful. It's a way of making, taking that data frame in that edge list form uh, into a, um, into more of a network uh, kind of data. So it's actually a big matrix I'll show you in a minute. It's like the library in Tyrell, Tadia, it's ready in the Tadia. Um, so yeah, now we've got this in this form. Um, what we actually want to do is say, filter out, uh, to say, just have these two ideas, say, Luke and uh, the four, say. And so all we've done there is this filter. Um, so the first word or the second word contains, that's strange, um, contain either Luke or the force. So we use this function from iGraph called graph from data frame. Um, and what this outputs is a kind of huge matrix. Um, it's kind of, each has these kind of edges in a special form of iGraph, which then just allows it to understand it. Um, and then rather than me copying out this next bit of code, I'm just, I'm just gonna pull it from, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna copy it across. So if you have the material, you can either copy that from there yourself. 
Um, but basically what we're doing there is taking this graph object, so using this ggGraph um, function from ggGraph, um, and then we're going to put that in there. We're going to put layout equals stress. Uh, this isn't really a visualization course, um, but it's going to show you something that's really quite cool, uh, which then pushes everything out. Um, we then same as kind of ggplot, we then add our elements. We're adding edges, um, and also going to add points, and then we're also going to add text, which is the, uh, the name. And then we're going to hope this works. Cool. So hopefully you can see that okay, but we can really, really nicely kind of visualize the way these words are linked. So you can see like. Uh, Luke and Master, Luke and Sir, Luke Trust, Wade, Skywalker, and so on. And you can see they're linked by force, and you can see, okay, the force is flowing, controlling, and it's powerful. You kind of begin to kind of get ideas about how these how these ideas are linked with, linked, linked within the text. Um, this is again like quite quite basic kind of a thing to start doing. There's loads more you can do, and there's loads kind of wrong with kind of what we're doing here. Um, but as kind of a very simple idea, a simple way of kind of communicating these text data, uh, this is a really nice, nice way of starting to do that. So yeah, I think there's now uh, another exercise. Got loads of exercises. Um, so I'll let you all have a go at trying to do that yourselves. Um, so again, give you five minutes.
Cool. How's everyone doing? It's all right, cool. Um, I realize we're actually blasted past halfway. Um, so what we do is we do this next little section and then probably have a bit of a break if everyone wants to go maybe get a coffee or something. Um, but yeah, first of all, I'll go through the answers and then we'll just do a bit on sentiment analysis and then um, have a bit of a pause. Cool. So again, kind of very similar to what we have here. Um, yeah, so we want to tokenize it this time into bigrams, um, look at which words co-occur most frequently. Um, you may want to remove stop words and similar there, uh, and then try and recreate this uh, this graph, but for kind of the, the whole, all, all three films, as opposed to just the, the one. Um, so as ever, read in the data, select just the cards we want. Um, then unless the tokens, but this time with n equals two. Then here again, unless the tokens, count the words, separate into first to second, anti-join on those stop words, uh, drop an A's if there are any, which there are. Then filter just so that we're just filter on the terms that we're interested in. So we're interested in things that are around loop and force. Um, remembering to library in all the packages we need. Then we use this graph from data function on that, on that data. And then very similar to what we just before, we can then plot this graph um, using this code here. Let's get this with uh, quite a few more. More terms on it. I'm not going to leave you to, you know, think about kind of what, what the differences are and why they're different, and also hopefully how you might try and use this in your own work. Um, so I do think this is a really cool technique. Um, the extension is actually really quite straightforward, um, but I will kind of leave leave that there for a second. Um, but I'm not going to go into it too much. So the real main difference is just we're using n equals three, and then we then need a third word and so on. Cool. Cool. So the next talk is about sentiment analysis. And sentiment analysis um, can, can be very, very powerful. Um, what we look at here is a bit more of a naive approach. Um, but the advantage of it is it's really quick, really easy, and kind of gives you medium good results most of the time. Um, naturally, if you go into the realm of deep learning and whatnot, you're going to probably get better accuracy and probably do more with it. Um, but here, we're just going to look at a, a lexicon approach. Um, kind of we met the stock word lexicon before. Um, and here, this is just a, um, a lexicon of words with their associated sentiment. Um, so what we do there is use this function called get sentiments from the database package. And there, there are a range of sentiments that you can choose. Um, so the kind of actually the first argument here is it's lexicon, so like which collection of software you want. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. So this just actually returns a data frame, very similar to the same as when we were using software earlier. Uh, with a word and then it's sent sentiments. This particular one is just positive and negative. Um, there are a few different types. So there, there are the Afrin sentiment, the Bing sentiment, the, the Lauren sentiment, and the NRC. Um, we'll kind of look at the Afrin a bit later. Uh, the Bing is what we're looking at here. Um, which is actually just you know, uh, categorizing as positive or negative. Uh, the Lauren one is more for financial data. So if you say running this through financial reports or something similar. Um, and 
Um, and actually, I'm not too much, I'm not very familiar with the NRC one. Um, but you can all go and Google this in your own time. Um, but the Affin one's particularly useful is this actually gives a, a positive or negative value based on minus five to plus five. Um, but I'll, again, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so what we can do is if we take our data, uh, we have it before. So I'm just going to take that. Might as well copy all over. So this is me again reading the Star Wars data. It's like just the ones I want. And I'm going to unnest the tokens, but this time I'm just going to keep it as word. I did need words. This is just the format we're kind of used to seeing. And what we can do is, so we might want to add your stop word for a start. And then we can then inner draw. So rather than this kind of anti join we did with the top words, we actually just want to inner join so that we only get the words that have a sentence associated with them. So inner join on the So actually, I'm going to just put a sentence in there because this gives us our stage frame mammals. And then by equals word. So you can see how scroll up to here this is also called word here and then sentiment you see this is why i've chosen word is so that this matches throughout um i didn't write this this was kind of came with the package this is kind of what it what it assumes So what we're going to do is pull in, okay, these are the words from our text. Uh, these are its counts, and that is whether it's positive or negative, uh, just based on this uh, this being lexicon, which has kind of been uh, again designed by kind of academics. Um, so what we can do from there, which I'm just showing the head and summarize. It's a very quick, mildly dirty way of just saying, okay, overall, is episode four positive or negative as a whole? And um, the answer there is, well, it's quite, quite a bit more negative than positive. <laughs> Nice. So what we can do is rather than having this as Bing, we can just swap that out for say happen. It's about there. I can actually show you what that looks like. So rather than having just positive or negative for the sentiments, it actually has this value, uh, which is minus, you know, minus one through, it's actually minus five through to plus five. Um, and this can be really useful for, say, producing more um, quantitative results or context. Um, 
And so, for example, what we can do is take this. Um, say we can actually count. Yeah. Yeah, so what I'm going to do here is actually also count the character in here. It's actually what I forgot earlier as well. Um, so, so I'm taking this tidy data frame and then I'm going to stop words, but then I'm also counting the words and the characters. So now we have the word, character, the value, the uh, frequency, and then value. And from there, we should be able to do this. Uh, so we have each character and their average sentiment score, and then the number of things that they say, the number of tokens they have. And what is quite nice is then obviously all this. So you can then add titles and labels yourself. Um, and so what we tell you, we can now just plot this really quickly. So you get, okay, so Leia is not overly happy throughout the film, uh, but is the most happy out of the characters, out of, out of, the, kind of the main characters. And that's kind of what I've done here with this filter. He's taking N is greater than 20. So just as only characters that have quite a few, have uh, more than 20 words. Um, and what we've used here is this reorder. So I don't know if it's, again, it's not a visualization, um, Kind of course, but this using this reorder within uh, within this kind of aesthetics is a really nice way of just quickly and easily getting these in in kind of this ordered way, which is really nice. Um, and we can see that kind of Tarkin and Vader down the end here are are the most negative. It's strange that Ben is quite so negative. I guess he does die in the end, but um, anyway, uh, you can see that kind of the, the rest of the characters are all up here. So it's just, a, again, like a nice, quick, easy way of saying, okay, looking at these different um, groups or these different characters here, uh, who's the most positive and negative? You can see how this, you can then apply this to lots of different things. And the next thing I'm going to show you is uh, a bit different. Um, but it, it's something called uh, sensible progression. 
So all we're doing here is looking at okay, so throughout the text, how does the sentiment change? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to first of all be splitting our text up um, into different sections. Um, I did actually say you're going to have a break. Do you, how are people feeling for that? Because I, I always were a little push for time, but do people want five to ten minutes quickly? You can put a yes or no in the chat or in the um, you can have a little yes tick back on. Yes, please. That's a, that's a firm yes. All right, cool. Um, let's have just five minutes um, to have a break. So it's just gone 12, I realize. Um, so we'll come back at maybe like seven minutes to seven minutes past or something like that. That's good for everyone. Cool. See you in five minutes.
Cool. I'll uh, probably actually give it to ten past. A few more minutes. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I hope we'll be able to get a quick coffee or something. I realize it's now into lunchtime as well, which is, um, so I'm sorry if everyone's hungry. Um, so yeah, I will continue. Take a minute. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so what we're going to look at is with uh, with sentiment regression is we, we've got a, maybe a longer text. We want to want to see how the, how the sentiment changes throughout. Um, you can imagine just almost just doing this for a time series um, for like data coming in uh, is, is another way. But it's going to what we're going to do here is maybe a little artificial. But we're actually going to split our, our Star Wars text into um, into little into chunks into chunks of hundred uh, lines, um, and then from there we're gonna um, kind of show the sentiment progression through that. Um, so let me get back to, yeah. Cool. So from there, I'm actually gonna say, um, unless it's tokens. So this is hopefully should be familiar. So we've put the data in, taking the ones we want, uh, and then unnest the tokens like this. And this then just what the head looks like. Um, what we want to do is actually make sure we're going to actually split it by line number. So the first thing to do is to mutate it, um, make sure the line number is as numeric. So this is kind of very similar to what we're doing with that people data. Where actually, normally your text data is not going to be this clean, um, but this thankfully is quite clean, which is why it's all the it's why the data has been given to you like this. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is just another mutate line. Um, Uh, is this 
is we're going to use this symbol here. And what this is, is kind of its floor divide. So if I actually just show you what it is, to so say, for example, you did um, 10. It's just nice to go, say, 100, and then by 10, uh, it gives you 10. So 100 divided by 10 is 10. That makes sense. But actually, if it was, say, 101, it also gives you 10, because it would have been like 10.0, whatever. Um, and so, well, 10.1, rather. Um, and so what this is doing is actually dropping that down to that nearest integer. Um, so that's actually what we're going to do here to kind of group these script sections um, by this little number here. And then once we've done that, we're then going to group by this script section. And then what we're going to do is summarize. I would help if we also added on our. So now that we've done that, we actually want to add on our sentence. Forgot that one. Let's just uh, look at the sentiments. There we go. So this is then line number, character, the word, and its sentiment. Then yeah, mutates have the line number, the line number numeric, split it all up, group by group section, and then some nice. That looks like. Uh, so value obviously has come from when we joined on this um, sentiments here. Um, so we're going to group by script section and then just check out, okay, what's the mean sentiment for that script section? So we get these uh, 10 different script sections and then we get this average score um, going across it. And then what might be quite nice is to... So our X is just going to be our group section. School. Yeah, I hope you can still read that. Um, then I'm going to add a gym line. points. So okay. uh, you can see that as the throughout the film, you can kind of almost trace different things happening. Um, so there's was a problem and then there's a success and then oh there's another problem and then they slowly get over it and then yeah success at the end. Um, you can almost follow this kind of uh, at least this narrative as it goes through. Uh, it's obviously quite basic. You'd have to kind of control what this is doing. Um, you know, it's very similar to histograms, right? You'd want to make sure you change this bin width to be the right kind of amount to do this and be proper. Uh, and obviously, you can see how this number works. So, say, if you're looking at, say, how um, sentiment changes with time, for example, is another really good way to do this kind of thing. Um, you just do it very similarly. Um, so, yeah, now there's an exercise. I realize we've had that break a few minutes ago, but this is not a break. This is a exercise break. Um, so I'll let you all have a go at that for a few minutes. So it's on page 40 of the um, materials if, if you are looking at those or you can just look at my screen. So yeah, no, five minutes.
So I do think that third part is uh, a bit more challenging. So um, don't worry if you can't get that. Cool. And um, just to kind of answer something that's in the chat a bit more, which is about building up like uh, kind of specific lexicons, say, related to healthcare. Um, th there's lots and lots of lexicons out there and each you can buy them. For example, there's a big commercial side to this as well. Um, and in these, there are a large range of different lexicons that you can go out and get. Um, for, for specific healthcare related ones, I don't know of any. You, you're going to have to really Google for that and kind of see what other people are using in the field. Um, another option is, is indeed to make your own. Um, so you may have a particular interest or you may have a certain text um, of, of interest that you may want to pull out certain words from. Um, and so you could just make a data frame of, of these different words with then say your category, uh, be that a sentiment or, or a category in terms of, okay, this needs to go to this different part of the hospital or something else. Um, and that, that's kind of another way you can approach that. Um, cool, I might go through these answers. Um, if anyone objects, let me know. Cool, so what are the most frequently expressed positive words in all of the Star Wars films? Um, and are they mostly negative or positive? And how does the sentiment change throughout the different movies? Um, so I'm just going to use the Bing sentiment for this first part. Um, so again, uh, to take out, take out all the um, take all the data, unless the tokens, move the stop words, um, find these counts, and then join the sentiments on with this inner join on um, sentiments. So the sentiments actually just come from here. Um, so it's just this, this data frame. Um, then filter. For example, to just positive, and you can just see that the top one's there uh, for that first bit. Yeah, one of the most frequently expressed positive words. Uh, again, very similar across the whole. Uh, we can actually just count the sentiment for each. So by here, uh, you can see that in total there are 836 negative words, but only 500 positive. Um, so I think that ratio has improved from, from the fourth book, but um, it's overall still definitely negative. Um, and then what we can do is do this whole um, chunking this up into different sections. Um, so we're going to, again, make sure that line, line number is numeric, uh, unnecessary tokens uh, to word dialogue, anti-join, um, and inner join on the sentiments. This time using the app in because we want that kind of numerical kind of representation. So we have the movies, the lines, the characters, the words, and their sense of value. Um, again, splitting into 100 kind of line sections. Um, so again, using mutate, and then this kind of floor divide here. A group by script section, and some of those. So this is very similar to what we had before, but obviously now we have zero for the first one and so on. Um, yeah, and then we can then pull that and see what that looks like. So you can see how, first of all, they actually have different lengths. So actually just splitting it by 100 isn't probably the best way to do this. Um, like you can figure out how to do that better, I'm sure. And you can see how these different films each have these different traces. So this red one's the one we're looking at before, episode four. That each one's got um, slightly different ways. This 
this is from the sixth one has <laughs> uh, it's not not an overly happy ending uh, necessarily um yeah So this um, final section here is uh, on word document frequencies. So we've already looked at just counts and we looked at ways to make better counts by say removing stop words and doing stemming and a few other bits like this and kind of removing other say characters or, or similar uh, words that you, you know, you're not gonna be interested in. Um, but actually these all rely on quality stop words um, or else you will just get a word out of the and I and so on. Um, but what this technique is doing is it's able to say, okay, within this particular document, um, so say it's this particular report or even a tweet um, or a, a single response from a, a customer survey or a patient survey or something like this, um, actually, what's the most important words within that compared to, say, a larger body of, of text? Um, so actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this in. So there's kind of there's, there's two parts to term frequency, inverse document frequency. There's the term frequency part, which we kind of already discussed, like kind of these counts or more, more specifically relative counts uh, of each term. So these terms therefore being words um, and this inverse document frequency. Um, and what, and so like maybe the things to talk about is what, what really a document is and kind of maybe what a, a larger corpus is. Um, so a nice way to kind of think about this is actually think about tweets. So say you've just scraped like, you know, a thousand tweets off the internet around a certain topic, say, the election or something similar, uh, the, the US election tomorrow. Um, and the so what you therefore might want to do is say, okay, what, what are the key words leading up to this election? Or look at a bunch of tweets and say, what, what are the key words in this in this tweet compared to the other ones? So you could group all of um, a certain group of people, say Republicans tweets, and then say, what are the key words in that section compared to um, another group of people? Um, and so what you'd have is, the term frequency is just the uh, within each tweet, the number of times each word exists. Um, and then it's say if it was uh, the, if it say happened a few times, then it would be however many times the occurred, but then divided by the total number of uh, words within the document. So you may have just, you know, 30 words, but then actually um, a keyword may appear twice in that. So it'd be two out of however many. Um, and then you have this idea of an inverse document frequency, which is kind of how many documents does that word appear, appear in? So if you have 100 tweets, but actually um, Donald only appears in five of them, um, then actually the tweets that do have Donald in them are probably, you know, the fact that Donald appears in them is probably actually the main point of that tweet. Um, so ND is the number of uh, documents in total. So if you had 1,000 tweets, uh, and then NTD is the number of documents with that term in. So say it's just five. Um, and it's inverse, so you flip, flip the fraction and you take the logarithm of that to kind of make the probabilities all work out nicely. Um, and there's, there's, this is really, really valuable for uh, working out, okay, what are the main words in this document at scale? Uh, and also you don't have to worry about soft words. You don't need to worry about the, um, are these stop words have come from somewhere else or actually they're not very good or, or it's filtering words I don't want or filtering out words that I do want and things like this. Um, and so, yeah. And so actually applying term frequency inverse token frequency is it's not that hard because there's this is function called uh, bind TF idea. So I'm going to go up to here again, just take these. Um, sorry, uh, if I didn't take that. Uh, 
uh, we get the and you and so on. These are all stop words, but actually rather than removing them like this, um, I'm actually going to split my text into loads of different sections. Um, so this is a bit artificial, but this is, you can imagine, rather than me splitting this text into 10 different chunks, um, this could be used with having, say, 10 different tweets or 10 different reports or something like this. Um, So what I'm going to do is very similar to what we did before. Um, is we're going to use ADC. Make sure that line number is numeric. So you, you can do this all this within the same um, mutate block. I just think it's a little neater to do like this. I think that's the difference. Again, split this up by 100. I'm going to show you what this looks like. This group section. This is kind of what we've seen before, um, but now it's actually split by script section. Uh, so again, like these top words are the, the, you, and you. And so each script section, say script section two, has the 74 times. Um, and so what we can actually do is, rather than dumping that into count, so we can take that from there, we can actually go with bind idf what this is the first argument here is this uh, symbol which is what we're supplying the term which is like okay so what what are our term frequency which is our words which is word it's like documents okay so the documents here are essentially our script sections and n is our frequency which just equals n Oh, yeah, because I'm with the actual counts on it. Yeah, I want these counts still. So, so you do actually need to supply counts into here. There we go. So if I can show you what it looks like for that. Blah, blah, blah. So this is in the words group section and the counts. So this is the word, the document, and the frequency. Uh, and then we can then find the term document. So then we then attach or bind onto the end, given these uh, frequencies that we're supplying and these documents and these words, it gives us the finalized term frequency and this document frequency. So we can actually see that although um, V in document two is loads of times, so its term frequency is actually relatively high. And this is uh, as a percentage of the total words. So actually, V is 4% of all words in, in this uh, script section. Um, it's inverse document frequency is zero because it probably appears in every single document. And as a result, it's term frequency, inverse document frequency is zero. Um, and so this really does allow us to uh, filter this out really nicely. And so what we could do is actually Range by ETF, ITF. Cool. 
So actually the 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 uh, the most frequent term frequency, inverse document frequency word is actually repair, because it just uh, appears maybe once in document two, but like quite a few times, um, and so on. Um, and so there's maybe the last thing I'm going to kind of show you is just a really nice way to visualize this. Um, so again, rather than me just I'm making those mistakes. I'm just going to copy this over. So what I'm doing here is just telling them how to say yeah for the data frame. And then I'm gonna group by so this is this looks like scan, so we should again. So it's there. So you've got the words, script section, or the document, um, kind of code if you like, the frequency, the term frequency, the inverse document frequency, and this the most important one is term frequency, inverse document frequency. Um, they're going to group by the script sections. They're going to just take the top six by term frequency, inverse document frequency. So this is just you know, within each group, give us the six most important words. Uh, we're then going to plot it using ggplot. So again, another really nice function here is reorder within. Um, so that's kind of reordering within the groups. Um, and it's reordering by word. Uh, sorry, x is word. By so it's ordering by a same frequency and document frequency, uh, and then the within is in the groups or script section. So, um, and then the y is being term frequency and document frequency. Then we add columns. And we're going to facet wrap. We're actually going to flip them so that rather than x being because like often text on the x axis you then can't read, but if you put it on the y, it's then like it's full length. Uh, so we're going to flip the coordinates, and then we're going to reorder that scale. Uh, I'll show what it looks like. Okay. So yeah, it's quite big. So what we've been able to do is say, okay, within each script section in the film, what are the most important words? Um, so this first bit, um, if, if you know the film that Luke's often complaining about how he, he can't wait to go to the academy, uh, but he can't because of the harness. Um, so that's kind of what's going on here is the, the harvest. And this is also when you first meet Obi-Wan. So you can see we're able to really pull out like, okay, this 10th of the film or the movie, what's, what's the most important kind of things in there? And we can kind of quite correctly say like, um, okay, yeah, so Luke goes out to fix the transmission lines, for example. Um, he, he talks a lot about the Academy and so on in this first section. And then he goes off, uh, he says how, oh, you can't wait to, he doesn't want to wait for the harvest to finish. Um, he finds Obi-Wan and so on, and kind of this, um, you, they get attacked by the sand people, for example. Um, and then it kind of continues through the film, and you kind of follow along the story just off this. It's a really great way of saying, what you're, we've got loads of documents, how do we quickly make sense of this? Um, you know, for example, this bit here, this uh, garbage trap where they get stuck in the, uh, the garbage cell. Um, and I think it's, just, it's really cool that you can actually do this um, so effectively. Um, but yeah, cool. There's now another exercise. Um, we've got 20 minutes to go. So what I might do is just give a bit longer on this exercise. Um, so it's basically do the same. Um, so I'll give you maybe um, like five, five to 10 minutes to do this exercise because uh, especially that extension is a bit harder. Um, and then we can kind of come back and kind of for a final Q&A at the end.
Cool. Um, you've had a few minutes. I realise you might not be able to fully finish it. Um, but yeah, if you if you let me know if we want to if you're finished or if you want to go through the solutions now. Cool. Um, right, so I start going through them. Cool. So this uh, first bit is to split the split the whole script into sections, just like we did before, um, and then put it into the right form for TF-IDF analysis. Um, then apply the TF-IDF. Um, so work out what these 10 frequency inverse dolphin frequencies are, um, again, by book section, and then visualize results with the then extension being um, now rather than just grouping by line number, also do it by film. Um, cool. So first we're doing again is as numeric. Uh, this time I actually changed this to 200 to make just a few, make a fewer um, script sections. Unless tokens, as we did before. So this is the kind of original data. Um, then we get the counts. Um, then we're going to, from here, let's show you what this looks like. So from this kind of familiar word script section frequency, so word document frequency. Um, we can then bind the TF IDF onto it, uh, make sure we've got these term document script and frequencies assigned correctly. And um, show that looks like again. So again, word and have all these extra columns. And um, obviously for things like V, which have a high frequency have now gone to zero. And then we're going to do the plot with a very similar code as what we had before. So yeah, this time it's just across all the Star Wars films. So uh, you almost can work out, you see what the Academy in season here from that from that fourth movie. Um, yeah, I think the less uh, the rest are, are less impressive. Um, but actually the extension is a bit more interesting because um, again, if we actually now unite the movie and script section into a single token, and then unnest and count on that. So you can see how this, this unite call uh, here has taken movie and script section, so movie and script section, and kind of bound them together. Uh, so this is then something which we then can then group on, group by, and kind of uh, manipulate very similar to how we had script sections before. Um, we can then apply the TFIDF onto that same thing. So there we go. Got these on the end. Um, and then we can actually make a, a big pop uh, doing this whole group by script section, taking these top top six um, terms, and again using the special reorder within, which is really nice to make this look really neat. Um, So hopefully you, you, know, you stare at this long enough, and you'll be able to pull out, okay, that's from that film, that's from here. Um, yeah, this is, um, yeah, that's that bit and so on. Um, and it's just really quite cool. I kind of leave you to look at this result and kind of think about uh, how you might use this again uh, in, in your work. Um, but yeah, cool. Um, I think that's that's it from me with regards to materials. Um, but I'm welcome to have any more questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to kind of maybe unmute your mic at this point. Uh, otherwise, I'll hand over to uh, Beatrice.
Could I ask for for any of the attendees? Um, have did you have you used text mining before? Oh, we have a question. Wait. Oh wait, no, sorry. What was that? Um, weighted log odds. Yes. Yeah, so that's what that log part was uh, in the TF-IDF expression. Um, so is, they're kind of related, but I actually I, I'm not too familiar with the detail. Yeah, um, I'm bringing Sorry, some yeah. some some notes to my to my questions. Um, so yeah. I attended um, last year's NHSR conference, and there was one person who used it for um, a staff um, patient survey in their NHS trust. Um, so that might be something you want to have a, a look at. Yeah, sure. Um, that sounds interesting. Cool. So. Um, I had a really general question, actually. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. Um, so, uh, first of all, thanks for going through all this. It's been really interesting uh, to see the stuff you can do with R, because I'm much more sort of beginner user. Um, when I'm using it, this might be really naive of me. I prefer to avoid uh, using libraries when I can, just so I can understand, you know, how. Um, the different data types kind of work and then use a library if it if um, I really need it. So for example, the stuff you've shown us here, it would take a long, long, long time to program all the different fantastic things you've done. I just wondered in general for, for Duncan or, or any of you guys actually hosting this, how you feel generally about whether you prefer to have a vast knowledge of libraries and things you can do with those or whether you prefer to understand what you can do with base R and then and then you know use a library when necessary. Yeah, I think, I think do you I understand what I mean? I think I haven't yeah. worked it well, but yeah. So it. I think my short answer is a, there's a lot of bad packages out there. Right. Um, so definitely, like, I think all the tidyverse, anything related to our studio, are high quality. Um, so I, I would use them uh, freely. Um, obviously, in a more complex project where I need to care more about the dependencies, then I do indeed restrict this as much as I can. Um, so I take out you know specific packages that I know and use. Uh, and kind of really question, do I need to pull in this other package? Um, okay. I don't know if, if anyone else has any, anything to add on that. No? I mean, maybe for a more specific reason, why ask the question. So for example, at the very beginning, yeah. you were doing some things with regular expressions and stuff like that. So yeah. I'm obviously nowhere near as advanced with regular expressions as you are. So thanks for going through some of the basics. That was really good to yeah, see cool. the stuff you use. Um, I have basically used base R things like grep and grep L and grep X and all those kind of ones, um, which have been really useful for me. And I don't know, do you think maybe I should avoid doing that and maybe stick with some of these where someone's designed a package that kind of uses the more, you know, common functionalities you would need? Or do you think that it's valuable to do that kind of thing until I can't anymore, I suppose? I think that's kind of then up to you and maybe the more experienced, experienced people would, would tell you otherwise. Uh, my approach is I like to stick with Tidyverse because it all fits well together. Okay. Um, and that's why I prefer to use string R rather than the um, grapple kind of things and yep. base R. But it doesn't matter. In the same way, I prefer to use a tibble over a data frame, even though data frames do very much the same thing. Um, okay. Because I suppose the last thing I'm conscious of is that this is a community, isn't it? So it's good if we're all using the same kind of stuff. So maybe yeah. I should, uh, yeah. yeah. If I may just add something here on the on the conversation, because... I classify myself as an evolving R dinosaur because I learned R like from 15 years ago. So I find myself sometimes <laughs> coding in base R like Grepl and then sometimes tidyverse. The benefit yeah. of using the base R functions like Grepl is that you're not uh, version dependent, right? So base okay. R is base R, it doesn't change. So if you, for example, have the bleeding edge of tidyverse or string R and some of your functions work, but a colleague has like three or four versions old tidyverse, then they might not have the same functionality that you have. So I'm, a, I'm like Duncan, like go for the tidyverse string R approach kind of because I think that's a very kind of well-made packages and they serve the purpose of improving the base R functionality, but definitely make good documentation as the versions of the different packages you use so that if anybody wants to replicate your work or install any of your work, they know that they need to have at least say dplyr version xx and above and string r version xx and above uh, okay thanks very much
Okay, so um, if there are not any other questions, then thank you, Duncan and Nicholas, for today's session. I really enjoyed it, and thank you for sharing your materials with us. I have just put the link to the evaluation form in the chat box. Please, please fill it in as your opinion is really uh, valuable to us and because we need your feedback so the NHSR conference can continue to happen in the years to come. Thanks again, Duncan and Nicholas, and I hope you have a good rest of your day, everyone. Oh yeah, thank you very Thanks. much. And, and there was a question Beatrice, about the video and I think I posted it oh. somewhere that it will be um, uh, on the NHS YouTube, right? Yeah. I think it might be on an Yeah, HS in the YouTube, YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, so I'll probably upload that this. as well. This, and at the. Sorry. Yeah. And at the end of the week, we will send um, everyone who has uh, enrolled to these courses the links. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> I know I jumped in as if as soon as we're uh, closing off, but uh, yeah, no, thanks all. That's it for me. Yeah, thank you, everyone. All right, everyone. Bye.